Okay. Um, it's okay, it's from Hashem. Okay? In other words, <laughs> he, he brings the aspect of Malchut among the nations, giving them the power to rule. For example, let's say there's a mitzvah that's called Lo Yelacha. It's the second of the Ten Commandments. There should be no other God besides me. Azai mecharef atzeruf atov shel dibor. And you destroy that mitzvah combination because the mitzvah combination is perfect. It gives you life force. It gives you energy. Every mitzvah gives you life. But let's say, for instance, you get involved in some type of Avodah Zarah. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean outright, I'm going to go, you know, bow down and, and worship a cow. It could simply mean that I'm choosing something else besides Hashem in this moment. Then what happens is that mitzvah of lo ye lacha, don't have another God besides you, the letters then flip around and they become a negative letter combination. Uvonet seruf ra, it builds a negative letter combination. V'nechakach ha-teruf hazeh al atzmotav. And it becomes etched onto your etzem, onto your bones. V'nokem bo. And then it accuses you. Like it says, It is your Avero that have turned away these things. And it says, That the death blow of the person who is not connected to Hashem is his Ra, is his action. His negative actions. However, but when you do teshuva in front of a tzaddik, in front of a talmid chacham, goes out from your bones these negative letter combinations, and Avidui, sorry. Adibur shel havidui. And what happens is you flip the letters back to a positive letter combination. So what he's saying is an unbelievable thing here. Before you go, only a couple minutes. You're not allowed to. Only a couple minutes. We're almost done. Almost done. Why does the Gemara say that a tzadi can't stand in the same place as a Belchuvah? Okay, nice. It's a nice answer. Okay, good. No tzadi can stand in the same place as a Belchuv. Why? The answer is not even complicated. It's very simple based on what Rabbi Nachman just taught, and it's so deep. When a person does a mitzvah, he gets a mitzvah. When a person does an avera, we're learning that it then becomes a part of his essence, so to speak, and it causes him negativity in his life until it becomes removed from him. But listen to this. Rabbi Nachman says, when you do tshuva in front of a tzaddik emet, to Hashem, then those letters, which were a negative letter combination, become a positive combination. What's that called? A mitzvah. Meaning, Let's say, for instance, a guy has 600, 600 mitzvot, and he did 600 averot. And you have another guy, he just did 900 mitzvot, no averot. And the guy who comes to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, and he does tshuva to Hashem in front of the tzaddik, then not only does he have his 600 mitzvot, but his 600 averot come out and flip into mitzvot. Now, how many mitzvot does he have? 1,200. All of his averot become mitzvot. This is the reason that the tzaddik can't stand in the place of the bal tshuva, because the bal tshuva actually has more mitzvot than the tzaddik. So, so that doesn't mean that Gemara, that the Gemara doesn't mean that the bal tshuva is above the tzaddik. I'm not saying above. I say he can't stand in the same place. Okay. 
Okay. I'm just telling you what the Gemara says. Can't stay in the same place. And I'm explaining you one of the reasons. Because about tshuvas, averot all become mitzvot when he does tshuva from love. What does tshuva from love mean? The gematria of love, ahava is 13. The gematria of echad, unity, is 13. Love and unity are connected. Now, why would a person ever go do tshuva to Hashem in front of a tzaddik and travel and pay money and go through all these maniyot in order to do something like that? Because he must believe that everything happens from Hashem. Otherwise, he would never go through all of those difficulties to do so. That's called echad. He has da'at. Because he has da'at, he's going to make a decision that based on nature makes no sense but based on inner spiritual reality, it's the only thing that makes sense. And that's called tshuva from love. And when you do tshuva from love, all of your averot become mitzvot. And then, it's better than even if you never did the averot to begin with. Because the averot itself becomes a mitzvah that you couldn't have had. And this is why the Mashiach comes from David and not from Yosef. Because Yosef is the Tzaddik Emet. He's pure. He never did anything wrong. But David is the Baal Tshuva. And all of his Averot become mitzvot. And that's even higher. Does anybody have any questions from tonight's lesson? I have a question. Go ahead. Hundred percent. Right, but let's say during that time he could have been doing something else. So technically, if it is from Hashem and God wanted him to go through this ordeal, that thing that he went through is worth more than what he could have been doing with, with say, with learning Torah or that kind of thing. There's no could have been doing. He did it. That means that so Hashem wants it. Again, this is what I'm telling you. If he did it, that means it was Hashem's Ratzon, because nothing can happen unless Hashem wants it to. So you can't say he could have been doing something else. Saying, I know what you're saying. Think about what I'm... Lord, again, think about... He would never want to do anything. Again, you have a free choice at every moment. Once the moment has passed, it's what Hashem wanted. At the moment that you choose, you have a choice. So there's no point on reflecting what was Hashem's Ratzon because it must have been for the best. But now I have a new choice, this moment. What do I do with this moment? So there's no sadness. So I'm saying you would never want to update anything else in the future. No, that's the opposite. You want to be learning Torah. Please. Why? Hashem wants you to. Yeah, I'm saying you, that's all you want to do. Okay, so why don't you? Because then you won't actually succeed with anything else. Who said that? Ah. Because <laughs> you are why not? I'm doing it, and I'm, I'm being matzliach, so what's the problem? Why are you saying that? No, I'm gi- I, how am I going to give you an example from someone else? Not someone else. Okay, we're talking about doing things for the right reasons. If you're learning Torah in order to escape your life, that's not a good reason to learn Torah. Benny, Benny, I'm, I'm answering your question. I'm answering your question. When you make a choice, why are you making a choice? This is called learning lishma, and this is called learning lo lishma. Now, if you learn lo lishma, then eventually, if you don't give up, you will come to learn lishma. This is what the Gemara says. Okay? However, when you're making a choice in your life, you need to ask yourself, why am I making this choice? A lot of people, they learn in yeshiva, in kolel, because they do not want to work, because they don't want to work. And there are other people that they learn in kolel mamish because they know that Hashem put this on the planet to do that. And it's the highest thing that they could do. Then it would be an avera for them not to do that. And only you know what the answer to that question is. And it's the same thing when you do something for your wife. You could do something and your wife wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, hey, can you go get me ice cream from the, from the, the 99 cent store? 
It's 3 a.m. and you're not working, I'm working. Okay? So you can either do it because you don't want her to be upset at you or you want her to help you tomorrow when you want to take a nap and, yeah? So that's one way. Or you can do it because you love her. You can do one, the first way is so that she will reciprocate, which is called conditional love. Or you can do it because she asked you to, which is called unconditional love. Very simply, if you ask Hashem, Hashem, please help me to move to the land of Israel. Okay? If Hashem gives it to you, but with in mind, I'm going to give this to you if you spend every day fasting. That means he's not giving you because he loves you. He's giving you because he wants reciprocation. But if Hashem loves you unconditionally, he'll give you regardless. And that's what he does. If your love is based on a condition, then you don't love. Love is not conditional. Okay, let's go with the first one. Okay. Um, like a, many people go to Iman and they, they do this, this uh, confession thing to Hashem in front of the MS Okay. Right? So, like, how am I supposed to believe? Guys. Am I supposed to believe that all of those people now feel that everything Hashem does is for the best? Great question. We need to finish the lesson for you to be able to understand completely what this concept means. And therefore, if I answer the question now, I would be doing you an injustice. You want me to come back? <laughs> I, no, I'm just being honest with you. There's more going on here, and, and, and this is like a very general question. Obviously, there are people who go there, they do tshuva in front of the tzaddik, and they don't come to this rec re revelation, this recognition. What's the reason? Because there's other mitigating factors. But if a person does it for the right reasons, it can't be that something that Rabbi Nachman says is not true. It never happens. Okay, that's a good answer. Okay. Okay. Let me see. Let me just. Let, we'll do one at a time, and we'll we'll flip around. Is there going to be uh, anybody who could say any prayer they want in front of Tzaddik, or it has to be like anything written, like like you know? How do you so there is a standard vidui, okay. but the main part of vidui is that you mean what you say. The well, you we say it in, uh, after we say the mincha, after we say shachri, we do vidui. There's a vidui like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, a shamnu, bagadnu, right? But there is also just vidui that you just talk at, at out. And Rabbi Nachman says when you come to pray, the best thing that you could possibly do is just mean what you say. Okay? It's very, very simple. So, so therefore, when you're there by the grave, you're going to be doing tikkun aklali with everybody anyway. And you're going to be doing maybe vidui with everybody or by yourself, whatever. But you need to make sure that you talk from your heart about whatever it is that you want to talk about. A person has sinned. Yes. And he is able to do it. Yes. Out of love. Yes. But all those that love that he did become mitzvot. mitzvot. So it's out of his bones or it's in his bones? No, it's out. That, that means they become mitzvot. When the, after you do vidui devarim in front of the tzaddik. Oh, so you have to do it anyway. Then it leaves you to a lot of extent, but it never leaves your bones. No matter what you do, it's still in your bones. Yes. It's not just Uman, it's any real tzaddik. I'm just giving you the I'm just giving you a practical example and one that I can take to the bank. I can't tell you anybody else because I'm teaching you and I can't sleep at night if I don't teach you something that I believe is the truth. For sure. So other people, it could be that they are, but I don't know for sure, so I'm not going to tell you. You're good if you go there. You can accomplish this Torah. Okay? There's one that I know for sure, and that's the one that I went to last year, but that's I'm going to this year, and that is Rabbi Nachman Sega. It doesn't have to be Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't have to be Rosh Hashanah. Nachman, just like two stones, three, four birds in one stone. Yeah. You know, but if you can go to Hanukkah, which is another time, it's a so The line isn't bad. What? The line is as long. It has nothing to do with the line. It's not about the line. If you're in the well, vicinity. You okay, listen, happening. you don't it have to do it like on the Rebbe's grave like, like, like that, okay? 
when you're in the radius, you're, you're in the vicinity, area, in, in the room, man, in the room the, you don't have to be by the field. You're okay. good. And that's how it works. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't to have to be. A, you don't. It's nice if you're able to go close. You don't have to be. I saw very, very big Sadiqim that they sit in desks which are feet away. Okay. It's fine. You have to be in the vicinity. Okay. And, yeah. How is David a Balchuva? Did you hear about what he did with? Uh, yeah. This is the main uh, episode, but the basic bottom line is that Yosef corresponds to the sphere called Yesod. Yesod is connected to the Tzaddik. The Tzaddik is the concept of a person that he has no Averot. Okay? He's completely pure, like Yosef was. But then there's something called Malchut, which represents the Bali Tshuva and the Gerim, that initially they are not Tzaddikim, but they become. And when they become, they actually have greater authority than if they never did. And actually the Gemara says explicitly, you're not allowed to anoint a king who has, an, who has a completely uncheckered past. He needs to have been through things in his life before you can actually make him a leader of the Jewish people. Yeah, for sure he's a Baal Shuvah. The Gemara, the, 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 Gemara, the, Gemara says, the Gemara says explicitly, David was not Rui, he wasn't fitted to do what he did with Bathsheba. So, what do you mean he wasn't fitting to do it? He did it. And the answer, says the Gemara, is because Hashem wanted him to be able to teach the Jewish people about tshuva. How could he teach the Jewish people about tshuva unless he's doing tshuva? There's a very explicit parak in Tehillim where he's doing tshuva to the tzaddik, to Natan. I said it today. Okay. What? Yeah. Natan comes. The, co- the, 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 the leader comes and he does tshuva to Hashem in front of him. That's that whole parak. You know what I'm talking about. Any final questions? Is, is it related to the class yeah, or should I turn yeah, it off? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not so no, 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 I'm, I'm just asking if it should be on the class yeah, or not. I think so. Okay. So you said that the, right, the Mashiach ben Yosef, right, the, the Mashiach ben Yosef, he never sinned. He's a tzaddik and that's like he's, he's not, never, no blemish. If Mashiach ben David, he's the Baal Shuvah. Yeah. So Rabbeinu is the Bechina of Yosef in that extent? I think so. I think. So you mean he never sinned? No. And, and who is? How did you think he never sinned? And Mashiach, like Mashiach. Ben David? Mashiach, we're going to, yeah. Like we'll see. We'll see. Okay. okay. How are you going to keep so going to be better to keep true if he never? He's going to have to be, have done tshuva. King David is king forever. Whatever King David did was not just for his life. That means that when the ultimate Melech and Mashiach comes, he will have to be parallel to David. That regard, if by, by the way, and there's a raya for this, because Rabbi Nachman says that Mashiach's parents will be eh eh. So why is he telling you that? Eh. There won't be no big tzaddikim. Come from a regular place. Eh eh. That's what he says. Eh. He says eh. Oi oi. Whatever. I don't know. Eh eh. Eh eh. What does it mean? Eh eh. What does it? What does it mean? It's in tzaddik. It's in Chaim Oran, I believe. I believe so. So look at in that regard, I have a question. Yeah. So if on that Bechina Rabbeinu is Mashiach ben Yosef, so how was he able to guide us Bechina of David by the Tshuva? Because like David has no life of his own. Mashiach ben David gets all of his life force from Mashiach ben Yosef. And we learn it from Yehuda and Yosef, from this so said, yeah, right, which is because Yehuda and Yosef, according to Kabbalah, is the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, 
and Yehuda's whole life story that comes about is completely intertwined with Yosef. And his ability to be king is dependent on Yosef doing what he needs to do beforehand. So their whole life is completely intertwined. You're telling me that basically Rabbeinu is Mashiach and Yosef and all of us have the Bechina of Mashiach and David, is what you're telling me? It's a nice Chiddush. We'll see. Okay. Yes, I, I, I'm with you. What if you, uh, what if you do the confession in front of the Emes Sadiq so afterwards you do it to be Avera? Right, so the whole concept of real tshuva is that you try not to. So obviously if, if, if you come to it again, but you have... For example, regular tshuva. Yeah. Tshuva and the last or the four parts of the tshuva, you say not to do it again. Right. right. And then... It but it happens again, right. right. So, so so if, if it happens that? again, you have to deal with the bone situation. So, but you still see that everything is for the best. So, we have to wait till the end of the lesson to get more clarity. We have to wait till the lesson. This is just, this is, by the way, this is how life works. I know that we're on our phones a lot and like things happen very quickly. Life doesn't actually work like that. <laughs> okay. <Dad. laughs> no, it's very important for our generation to know because it is the greatest confusion in our life that we all have something constantly in our hands that works one way and life that doesn't work anything like that at all. That's very, very confusing and very, very uh, damaging to a person's ability to experience reality in his life. Do you have a smartphone? Yes. <laughs> I do. You want to know something? Yeah. Yehuda slept with his daughter-in-law. Oh my gosh, I don't know how you're about to connect this thing with me. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean that, that like there's a lot of, wrong. There's there's a a lot lot of reasons why people do certain things. I'm just trying to tell you something. I'm trying to explain to you something. I'm trying to explain that the way a smartphone works is not how life works. That's all I'm saying. And, and, and therefore, why are so many people in our generation depressed and anxious all the time? Because we're doing this and things are happening really quickly, and then we put our phones down and nothing's happening quickly. Just think about it. You have one last question? Go ahead, have a good night. You said that um, you have um, someone like a person or place or a thing that is, is uh, controlling your life and your place to that person, place, and time. But it's, it's your influence, it's your authority, right? You're completely free. What is it that the Gemara says about it? It says that the only person who's, the only person who's a slave to Hashem can be free. Right. Is that where you're bringing yes. this from? I'm not bringing it from anywhere. I'm, I'm bringing it from the Quintin Moran. Yes, it's, it's connected to this. Okay. It's connected to this. Who's a Ben Chorin? Who's a free person? They call the Torah Cherut. It's called freedom. Why is it called freedom? Because when you, when you are... Uh, directly receiving your influence from the Torah only, then you're free from everything else in the world. Any people, person, or thing. That's called being free. It's not freedom in the sense that we're taught that free, free means that I do whatever I want because that doesn't even exist because nobody does whatever they want. Like let's say for instance after this class, if somebody wants to go get a snicker bar, are they kosher? I don't know. Can we give them like a, yeah? Okay. Well, so, right. so wait, one thing. No. So you want to eat, so then your appetite becomes your king. So you're not free then either. You're never free. You always have to have an influence. However, you can, instead of choosing your appetite, you can choose Hashem. That's your point of freedom. And when you choose Hashem in every case, you're free. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of tefillah. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of trying, falling and rising. And with Hashem's help. You just said in the, in the lesson that you take something in your life that happened to you and you have to speak it out to Hashem in his portico. Yes. Um, Rav Rosh says in the Garden of Amunna that the only way you can build faith is if, if you um, evaluate how is your faith, how was it over the past 24 hours while you do his portico and you speak to him about every, every situation that you went through and during the day. That's a good practice. Is that, is that true though? That's called Cheshbon or Nefesh, and Chazal brings it down. It's not, it's not Rav Arush's uh, Chiddush. He, he's just talking about it again, even though nobody talks about it. It's very, very clear from Chazal, you should do something called Cheshbon or Nefesh every day. That means that you look over your day, 
and you look over, oh, you know, I, I struggled here, here I, 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 I felt like I made progress, here, um, you know, I think I could do better, but I'm proud of myself. This is something that Chazal say to do. That's not what, in the shir, you just said to do. You know, that's not what you meant. It's all included in Hippodidut. Rabbi Nachman says in one place that the essence of Hippodidut is Cheshbon Nefesh, which you just spoke about. Elsewhere he says the essence of Hippodidut is Bitul, self-nullification. Elsewhere he says Hippodidut is where you can experience Ruach HaKodesh. So these are all different elements of Hippodidut. Now, that's why there's like this basic formula that a lot of people say. You thank Hashem for the things in your life. You talk about the things that you're struggling with. Hashbun or Nefesh, you're going through your day. And you ask Hashem for help in whatever it is that you need help. And through this, you get to um, check off all the boxes. Okay? There's no rules to it. But there's no rules. There's no rules. There's no rules. If your mom is so jacked up and you need to go and scream for it, but then while well, thank you, Hashem, I did listen. There's no rules. There's good preferences to do this. It's vice versa. But there's no like. You have to. Yeah. Okay. Everybody have an amazing night. Tomorrow night. Rav Tomer is going to be here at 9 p.m. Every class is going to be at 9 p.m. And his class is going to be how to take teachings like this and bring them down practically. So it's very good to have both these classes because we're getting into very deep esoteric ideas. And even though I try my best to make them practical, it's, it's still a Kutumaran. It's like the deepest book that there is. Okay? So it's very good to come tomorrow to Crossing the Narrow Bridge where these are how to use all of these teachings in your practical day-to-day -day life. If you do both of those things, it's going to give you a real shot to be able to live with these teachings in your life and to achieve the things that we're speaking about. Then uh, Thursday night, we're going to Bezrat Hashem have our fourth Kumzitz. Last Kumzitz last week was, was really something incredible. It's like one of my uh, all-time life highlights. Really, it was, it was very, very special. So Bezrat Hashem, hopefully it just... Uh, increases more and more and more. The Kumz is also a very important experience because one of the essential things that Rabbi Nachman is trying to bring over to you that he got from his great-grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov, is that learning Torah is one expression of connection to Hashem. Praying is another expression of connection to Hashem. Working is another expression of connection to Hashem. Being with your wife is another expression of connection to Hashem. The whole entire goal of the Baal Shem Tov, one, one of the essential goals, is to shatter this lie that Hashem only exists when you're reading a book. Hashem is in every aspect of your life. So one of the deepest ways to experience Hashem is through song, it's through being with your brothers with love. It's, 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 Rabbi Nachman says explicitly that, that, that listening to holy song can do something for you that nothing else can do. Okay, and Bezrat Hashem, this should be holy song on Thursday, and uh, you should bring your friends and, and family, and we should continue to try and uh, help this grow. This is the month of Elul. Um, this is the month of Tzedakah. Um, if you're able to financially contribute and help, it is the biggest chut in the world. And if you're not able to, it, the essence of Tzedakah is that you give of yourself to a great cause. So if you don't have physical money, but let's say you can get a friend to come, or you can um, like shine this light on somebody else, <coughs> talk to them about the classes, that's also in its essence called tzedakah, even though it's not physical money. Okay? Everybody have an amazing, amazing night.